Hey guys, Pete here. This is a conversation I had with Hugh Howey, the author that wrote the book series The Silo TV Show is based on. In case you were wondering, I wanted to give a quick spoiler warning. We mostly talk about everything that happened in season one, including the finale. We also talk about some of the adaptation choices related to the books and get into some of what he knows about season two filming, which is already underway. But there are no major spoilers about future story points to worry about. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. Why do they care so much? Your tape is way better than theirs. Yeah, I know. Doesn't make any sense. Unless it does. All right, now that the first season of Silo is complete, I wanted to talk about the great finale and where things are going next for the series. And who better to do that with than the guy who wrote the books? So today I'm happy to introduce you, Howie. How's it going? It's going great, man. Can't believe the first season's already behind us. It's crazy. Yeah, it kind of flies by, doesn't it? If, yeah, it like went... Uh agonizingly slow and then super fast somehow like the weeks felt so long in between episodes yeah i was following along with the uh the little videos that you're putting out after each episode and um thought that was really an interesting way to do that and i've seen you out there quite a bit talking to people and sort of engaging so um yeah it's nice to see that people are responding to it it's got a pretty good reception i mean we've already got a season two started is that right yeah they're well underway filming um i've been watching dailies and it's um season two is bonkers it's it it is so crazy watching what they're putting together yeah i I can't i'm I'm really happy to see this is working out um i was a fan of the books i read them Uh, i'm not sure what year it would have been but it's been a little bit of time since i first discovered them uh, and then I went back and reread them before the series started. And I do have one, before we get into like all the stuff that everyone's here that wants to hear, I do have one question that I want answered like on a personal level, I guess, is sort of a nerdy one. Sure. But I remember when I first read the books back then, I had this idea in my head that they were all wearing coveralls. Like they were all wearing those like jumpsuits, um, like maybe something like you see a mechanic wearing at the auto dealership or whatever, you know? So when I went back, it, 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 it's overalls. So is this like a Mandela effect? Like where I, I just, you know, like had the different thing in my head and, or, or what's going on there? What did they wear in the silo inside the books? Um, that's funny. Is it overalls? I always thought it was coveralls as well. Maybe, maybe we, there's a glitch in the matrix. Yeah. Uh, I, don't I, know. I, I always, just, I always <laughs> assumed they had sleeves, but, um, I get, and who knows, they could have, what we call coveralls and they just call them overalls because you know it's ah. over all your other bits and pieces um all right well yeah that that's funny yeah it, it i was just like as i know in the show they changed it and that probably makes sense right um i like yeah, the I think, idea of them all wearing the same things with different colors i but, think it would look a little too um too sci-fi or something it's kind of how in comic books, superheroes look like they're supposed to be basically nude with just painted colors on them, you know, skin type. Mm-hmm. And then you do it in live action and it just looks dumb, yeah. um, which is why a lot of Marvel movies, they spend most of the time like in regular clothes. Um, so, yeah, I think there's been a lot of people like they're supposed to be wearing like all the same color, but mm-hmm. it, it, wouldn't have, it wouldn't have looked as cool as the, the what the wardrobe department pulled off. Yeah. I mean, I do think in the book it was, it made for, it added to the atmosphere of things like it, you know, it was fun to imagine it that way, but yeah, sometimes whenever you go from the book to the TV show that there, there's, there's things that work a lot better. And we'll, yeah, we'll definitely... that's, that's the genius of Graham as a showrunner and his writers. They, you know, they, they spent a lot of time thinking about these decisions and, and trying to imagine like, is this going to look right if we, if we do a direct translation and I, I think this is one of the ones that they really got right to not uh, not go with. When I first heard it, I was like any other reader. I was like, no, you know, we, we should do this. And then I thought, ah, oh, you're right. This is, it's going to look a little hokey if we, and, and also the characters won't have as much individuality, but in the books, it really helps set aside the class differences in our minds. Yeah. 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 I like whenever there's, I guess I can't, I was going to talk about something that I can't actually talk about because it's, it's later. Um, 
but yeah, there are times whenever they identify each other by colors and it's, it's really effective to kind of set the scene that way. I, like I said, I, I do want to congratulate you. I mean, I think that this has been a success, um, for a brand new show. It seems like there's been nothing but good news across the board as far as it's being received. What does that feel like? Uh, it's a, it's a huge relief because a lot went into getting this made and you never know, you know, when you're going to get another shot at, at getting something adapted. Um, and you just don't want to upset, uh, all the fans. That's my first concern. Like all the people who've been wanting this for so long, I just want them to be happy. My next concern is like a lot of, uh, publishing partners around the world, um, kind of priced in an adaptation when they, when they bought the series because th there was a lot of hype about Ridley Scott making a film out of this years ago. And I, I just want them to earn back, you know, what they've invested. And then all the people who've worked hard on the show, you want them to have a good reception because, you know, it's so sad seeing things come out and, and get bad reviews. A bunch of people worked on every one of those projects, but yeah, um, to say that it went well is like really to put it mildly. It's, it's, been the the number one drama apple has ever had um i i've been checking in with with everyone there and at amc who helped launch this and everyone's just over the moon like it's people had hopes for it when they saw what we were putting together uh internally they had hopes but it's it's exceeded everyone's expectations which is very rare <laughs> gotta love it though right <laughs> yeah man i mean it's just you know, I've got, you know, Stephen King's a fan of the show, which is cool. He's been tweeting all about it. And yeah. um, it's the the reviews. It's I love seeing on Rotten Tomatoes that the critics and the reviewers both are super happy because that doesn't always happen either. Yeah, that's true. I, that is one of the things I wanted to ask you was it's a, it's been a long process, right? I mean, as as far as I could tell, you actually sold the film rights way back like right after like maybe a year after you started publishing the, all the short stories that would eventually be called wool. Right. Yeah. I think we did the, we do, we actually were in discussions with Ridley before the fifth part of the first book came out. So wool wasn't even completed mm. and just on the strength of the first four parts and how well they were selling. Um, I'd already written a rough draft of the fifth part. And so we sent that out to a bunch of uh, film people and uh, an auction was brewing um, uh, on the book this is before it hit the New York Times list or any of that stuff. So um, uh, it's been since like early 2012. And I, the whole time, I just enjoyed the process and haven't yeah. expected anything to actually get made to be sitting here talking to you now after with a, <laughs> a, a first season under our belt, a second season filming, and the kind of reception we've had. It just feels like an absolute dream. Yeah. So I, I did want to, I mean, this is probably a question you get all the time. It's probably something that people have, have heard. I mean, I, I certainly know the answers to to this question, I guess, but I do see that a lot of my viewers, this is their first experience with it is, is the actual TV show. They didn't, they, they've never heard of the story. They didn't read it beforehand and they're in love with it. So would you be able to give those people a brief history of how this all started? Cause it's a, it's a really interesting story. Yeah, it's it's insane, really. I um, my first book was with a small a publisher, the small press, and what I learned from that process was like I'm I don't think publishers are for me. I want to just self publish, <laughs> and so I was working in a little bookstore in North Carolina and writing novels on the side. And um, at the time that I it was well, it was like my seventh published work, and um, uh, at the time I was making like maybe a hundred dollars a month on direct ebook and print sales, you know, I wasn't making a career out of this, but I was, I was, and this, was, I was this was pretty early in that, in that, that sort of trend, right? I mean, this wasn't an established way to, to make a living yet at this point, was it? No, this, the stigma I had to go through while self-publishing was unbelievable. I was in a writing group up in North Carolina and, um, they all thought, you know, I was an idiot and everyone I talked to online <laughs> when I, because I, I bought the rights back to my first book. Like I, I went from having a traditional path to going all in on self-publishing. And everyone said, even my publisher, they said, this is the biggest mistake you'll ever make. But I was happy. I just wanted to write my kind of stories. Wool was a, 
uh, like 56 pages when it was published. It was just mm-hmm. the, the, the story of Holston. And there's no other way to publish that. Like it's too long for a magazine. It's too short for a publisher. But, you know, Kindle readers, they don't care if you, I'm charging 99 cents for something you can read on your lunch break. It seemed like a fair transaction for everybody. Mm-hmm. And I was at work one day just looking at uh, my sales stuff. And uh, Wool was like outselling everything I'd ever published before. And I, I checked on Amazon and the reviews were like, in the beginning, every review was a five-star review. It was insane, the reaction they had to that short story. And uh, the only thing they said was, where's the rest of the story? Like, we want more. Mm-hmm. And I, dr- I dropped the novel that I was writing at the time and started um, releasing the rest of the novel in a serialized form. And it was a lot of fun because I was on Facebook and on my blog, like um, just talking about the process and, and, and interacting with readers while they were falling in love with these stories. And the next few months were just crazy. Like all five parts of wool just climbed up the bestseller list on Amazon. And, and, and within a month or two, I was making enough that I put my notice in at my day job and just concentrated <laughs> on writing. Yeah. And so it was just, it was like a, it was like a, a, a community instead of here's a book and then it does well. We were doing something organically together. And, and my first like thousand fans on Facebook were really proud of like how, how early on they were. They called themselves the thousand. Yeah. And a lot of them are with, you know, enjoying this ride and, and interacting with me every day still. They've been a part of this process for, for like 12 years now. Yeah. And, and I think that, it's strange, but I think that the way that that's put together actually adds to some of the, of what the early appeal of the story is, because what I liked about it, I think the first time I I didn't read it individually, I read it after it was all, I guess, all complete. Um, you know, the, the first two books at least were, were complete, I think. Um, so what I liked though, was that there was this steady, pace of revealing things like it was asking questions and it was revealing things. And I, and I wonder now looking back, I mean, it seems like a lot of that was because like you said, the first book was just about Holston and, and Allison. Right. So you kind of had to answer all those questions in that 56 pages rather than leave them for, uh, you know, the end of the book or something like that. So, yeah, yeah, it's a great point because if uh, if I'd written that as a novel, a lot of what you learn at on page fifty six, I would have saved for page five hundred. Right, right. And um, and I think the I think it, it's made for a really fun uh, TV show adaptation because we get to like you know show a lot of uh, our hand really early on, and yeah. I, the people who are not readers and who are just viewers are like they're expecting every episode to have like some like that we should be you know on a different planet by now like they want (laughs) that that level of pace but the the tv show has followed kind of what the book did where you had this explosive opening and then you have a build-up to juliet and how when she gets the same information that allison had the results are completely different and why the results are different depend on what happens, you know, over all these other reveals throughout the story. So I, I, I lucked into an amazing, um, uh, like, like we, we, we wouldn't be able to cast the characters we cast it if we didn't kill some of them off because of mm-hmm. availability. Yeah. And, and so we're able to like, go get like, just tr- like getting David and getting Rashida. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's just dumb lucky the way it all worked out. Yeah. And there's a real balance that you have to, I mean, I think this is where, you, you know, working with someone like Graham Yost, you know, you get, you get some, some experience in there of like, there's a risk when you get some characters that are that appealing and that people are going to go for that hard in the beginning of the story. And then they're dead, you know, like completely removed from it by the second episode. And then you have to restart that process of introducing someone new. So there's a little bit of a gamble there. And um, I mean, how do you feel that, like that, that they navigated that? Do you feel like that that was uh, something that 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 translates well to TV and in, in this format of like ten episodes and the longer the longer narrative? Yeah, I I love it because I you know, I just went back and watched the pilot again. Um, they 
uh, Apple would stream the entire thing on Twitter, and even though I could go watch it on like 10, 1080p on my yeah. <laughs> big screen upstairs, I was like, I've never seen a um, studio do this before. So I had it running in a window while I was getting work done. And just, you know, what's awesome is we will never lose David and Rashida and and that pilot and, and seeing David and Rebecca together in the in the second episode. And um, it's always there for us to go like spend time with them again. Yeah. Um, what's what's great for me, I think, is like all the other characters we get to spend time with. If if we didn't kill these people off, like Paul Billings is so much more fleshed out in the TV yeah. show than he is in the book. Um, uh, Kennedy, the this uh, yeah. we just spent time with again at the end of episode uh, nine and, and who opens uh, in, in episode 10, he becomes a huge part of this show and even into season two. Um, and he's, he kind of landed in our lap. Like um, it's one of those situations where the actor is so good and so magnetic on screen that you're like, all right, we, how do, how do we make this a bigger role? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's very similar to what happens with writers. Writers are terrified of killing off characters because once you have a character people love, they do so much heavy lifting for you, but you have to have confidence in yourself. Like we know that we can put together more characters. People are going to fall in love with and yeah. going, going into season two, you're going to spend a lot more time with the people in mechanical. So we have incredible cast down there in Harriet, who plays Walker, uh, with Shirley, with Knox. Um, and I can't wait for people to spend more time with these actors. Yeah, so we're in that weird period of time, like you and I right now, people will see this after, but we've, we've both seen the finale. It hasn't hit yet, so you haven't seen the reaction to this. Um. I mean, yeah, I like I it. Wait. <laughs> yeah, I liked it a lot. I, I think that it was a it was a good place to stop. I, I had that feeling when I was in the middle of the season. I'm like, are they going to get the whole book? And then I realized, okay, they're not. So what's, where's the spot? Where would I stop? And you know, I think that was the natural answer. You know, what where you, where you did where you chose to do that. Whenever you think about that closing shot, right? Um, what are you hoping that people? are seeing whenever they, they, they look out into that world that, that she's just entered? Uh, well, I, I think, you know, I don't know what percentage won't expect it because you've got um, quite a few readers who are waiting for that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people who are new to the show have already guessed, like, mm -hmm. there's got to be more than one silo um, and, and are feeling like that might be the twist at the end. Um, but I would say maybe half the audience won't see it coming or know for sure. And yeah. I hope they feel what I felt when I was writing that originally, which is uh, a multiplication of the despondency that you feel in, in wool when you're in, in, or, sorry, it's the wool is the book, but and when you're uh -huh. watching silo, you got all these people going through really tough times. And when you stick your head over that hill, which when I wrote this, I was, I was literally thinking about Sid Arthur, um, sticking his head over the wall of the palace. Uh, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with, uh, Buddhism and, and the, the, yeah. how the, the philosophy got started. Sid Arthur was contemplating life. And I, I think he heard someone wailing or something in the streets and looked over the wall and realized he lived in a very cloistered, uh, luxurious kind of palace setting. And he just saw that humanity was bigger than his imagination. Mm. And that's what wanted him to figure out how to end in suffering, his own suffering and then suffering for the people. And you've got this like really dark story and you think things are terrible. And then when you pop up, you realize, hey, other people are going through really bad things as well. And you quickly discover people have gone through worse things. Um, the way you thought your problems were huge, the problems of the world are even bigger. And it's, uh, the sort of the, the, the circles of intra, of, uh, empathy that we're mm -hmm. really talking about here. And it's, this is all subconscious. I mean, I'm conscious when I'm writing it, but it's a subconscious hope that when people see that, they just feel all the emotions they felt for that season have this kind of multiplied effect. And then there's, there's an amazing like hatch mystery there. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God, if that's what's happening here, what is happening in all these other ones? And 
who are those people and when do we get to meet some of them? Yeah, I whenever I I, I was was wanted to ask you about the inspiration for this because it makes me think about Plato's allegory of the cave, you know, because of the way that they're literally underground and they 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 only see that part of reality that they're allowed to see. And yeah. you know, so when that's, I was, that was the inspiration for the original story for yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, that's I, I think that comes through um but so it's good. And, you know, I was making my video about the the final and I, I use that a lot. So it's good to hear you say that so that I won't have to um, to go and edit it. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, I think that's something that when you think about the way the show is put together and the way that everything falls into place there at the end, I think that's the thing that people will come to as they, they realize, right, that, that she's going out into the world and nobody like you can't really say what that is. But I mean, that's such a huge difference from where she was at the beginning, where she wants to just be there working and taking care of this thing that's right in front of her and making sure that everybody has power so that, you know, she is of service, you know, that she has a purpose there. And now it's like, just because she wanted to learn the truth about what would happen to this person that she cared about, now she's going into somewhere completely uh, different. Yeah, I think... What's cool about her journey in this episode is she starts off um, really having a hard time having relationships with people. But over the course of this episode, it's her relationships with people that actually keep saving her and mm -hmm. propelling her forward. Um, yeah. You know, her relationship with Walker uh, saves her, uh, her relationship with uh, her fellow mechanics like Shirley, but also the relationship she develops with Billings, um, uh, all these... Um, people that have a hard time trusting her uh, and, and Holston had the same kind of um, kind of swing and emotions about her. Um, they come to admire that she's very competent and she, you know where you stand with her and she uh, has the right motivations. Like she's not selfishly motivated at all. She's always trying to figure out like how to sacrifice for the good of, uh, of her friends or for the silo. And I, I love that she's like rewarded for those interpersonal um, bits of growth that she has in the in the first season. Yeah, because I, I mean, I thought that was, I mean that was my impression. And what I, what I really liked watching this as someone who knows where the story's going is that a lot of what's there with the character felt really intentional. You know, it, it felt like it, it was all connected to things that will pay off later, basically. You know, without giving anything away. So. I, I was really surprised where I saw some fans who who thought that she was that that abrasiveness that she has that like little bit of like social awkwardness or whatever you would call it, you know, the way that she's just not really good around people. You know, you kind of made that point in the book about her liking machines, like being more comfortable with machines than she is with people like they misunderstood that for somehow her being selfish or being an unlikable character, but I, I, I never read her that way. I, I, th I thought of it more re as a relatable character where she, you know, she has her flaws, but she, she is at the bottom of everything. You know, she's, she's there trying to do more, you know, do more good than, than harm. Yeah. She's so devoted to her job and, and her crew as well. Like, uh, she, um, is, is, other mechanics look up to her because she just gets it done. Yeah. Um, I, I, I love like viewer frustration and reader frustration is a good thing. I think mm. if, if people are just happy about everything, then they don't, they're not in for a, a, a fun ride. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact, the fact that people are like, she's not likable. I like that because it means that they want their protagonist to be likable. And that's the journey that she's on. So if they, if they, you know, nourish that dissatisfaction and stick with the show, then they're going to be rewarded with an amazing character arc. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't enjoy it. I think some people are into it are what, what they, in literature we call Mary Sue's, which are these perfect characters mm -hmm. that um, it often happens because the author is trying to, it's like wish fulfillment. They mm -hmm. want their character to be perfect in all the ways that they're not. And I'm the opposite. I want my characters to be as flawed as I am yeah. and to have some room for growth. It seems like it'd be more fun to write those ones. It's, a, it's so much more fun to write. I, <laughs> I, I, 
I've always, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what scars you have on your body, but we all have scars. Like mm -hmm. I'm talking about literal scars. Yeah. And if we look over, each one has a story. Um, you know, I, uh, when I'm trimming up a character, you can't just have this like, you know, 38 year old blank canvas that's never been in love. So the first, you know, you write about them falling in love. Like it's the first time, like you got to remember that when they were teenagers, they had their heart broken. Mm -hmm. And, and you got to remember that their pockets are full of mementos and things that they carry with them every day. And I think giving characters that depth is, makes it so much more rewarding to, to write about. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I I think that's, you know, I think that whenever I thought about this becoming a TV show, that that's what I hoped to see was that we would um, get to look at these characters and get to know them better, because that's really what TV does well. You know what I mean? That That's that's sort of what it excels at. Uh, you, you have all these different mediums and they all sort of have their their strengths. And I, and I think that, you know, being able to watch this character for for multiple hours and, and see her go through multiple things and, and the way that she changes and then realizing that you do know her and you have a connection to her. I mean, that's where TV really, really kind of, you know, can, can be moving, you know? So, yeah. And, and you, we get to, instead of cutting things out, which is what we would do if we made a feature, we get to add stuff. So um, in episode uh, nine, you get to see um, Sims's wife make a really interesting decision and then have a conversation with Robert about how they have a bigger goal. And you're like, what the heck is this? Yeah. That's um, exactly what I said. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we want, um, when we're in the writer's room, we're like, okay, how can we make a story that is great for people who are unfamiliar with the material, but then how can we also make readers who feel like they, um, know this story, you know, by heart, how do we get them on the edge of their seats as well? And TV allows you to do that. You get to, come up with all these subplots that, that, uh, are new to, um, the, the source material. Yeah. I, I do have a question about, you know, um, you, obviously you can't answer it, but I do have a question about what's going on with, with Mrs. Sims. I don't know if that her name is, I don't know if she's been called by her first name. I, I know in the credits, it, I didn't catch it. So I do have an idea. I do have a question about what's going on with her. And then also Billings, like you said, you added a lot of, a lot to that character. Um, he's, he was basically, he just basically just there to do a job in, in the book, if, as far as I remember. And so we're, we get to know a lot about him again. He's one of, he's a complicated character. He, he He's mostly good, but at the same time, he's everything that he does is, is, sort of because i mean it's all based on this lie that he's telling that like he doesn't want anyone to know what happened we see him we see that get exposed in the finale but then something weird happens he gets to become sheriff anyways so i'm i'm really curious about that because in this in the episode before we saw that he had he had seen you know he had that perception his, he had that alteration of perception right he saw the the book he saw the same book that Juliet saw a few episodes back and, and he has different ideas about what's, what the world is at this point. And so, yeah, I thought, I thought that was a very, very interesting way to end the season for his character because there's a lot going on there, you know? He's so complex. Uh, one of my favorite characters in the show, um, just when you think about what's going on with him internally, uh, what I loved about, um, his reaction to that book, you know, this is a guy who, who's follows the pack so closely. He wins like, you know, the packed version of a spelling bee and mm -hmm. he knows what to do with this relic when he sees this book. Like this is, this has to be turned in. And it's like too big of a shock for him to even do that. So he's just got to destroy it. That's the only thing he can think to do. And then there's a part of him that can't get rid of all of it. Yeah. And it's just pain. It's painful for viewers to know that there's not many photographs like this left. Yeah. And you're going to, you're going to set them on fire. Like watching that burn is painful for me every single time. Yeah. Um, because you think back to Gloria too, right? You, you you think about her saying, you know, you're the only one that can keep this alive. And then to see that pretty quickly, as far as the, you know, the story time goes be destroyed. Yeah. And how good Billings is at, at his job. Just thinking about, okay, where did, where did Juliet think to hide something in the past mm. and then uh, to 
uncover the way he did is is absolute genius and shows how good he would be at that job. But I think, you know, the reason people want him in that job is is he's always seemed meek. Mm-hmm. Um and that's because he's hiding yep. this uh the syndrome, which doesn't let him be his full self. He's constantly worried about being seen. Mm-hmm. And if he didn't have that um stigma, uh you you could just see in that moment of him being by himself and being a detective, how he would one hundred percent be a great uh candidate to replace Holston. Um which is so ironic because all the the yeah. good guys didn't didn't want him in that job in the first place. But the reason people in judicial and in IT want him in that that role is because they feel like he's someone they can manipulate. Mm-hmm. And and I love that about this character because he's not he's he's not he's got, he's principled and complex. And um, in the book, that was the idea and the heart of this character that what we need for uh, a just society are uh, people and positions of power to make difficult and good decisions. And that's what he does on the way up with, um, you know, I can't, I don't want to spoil anything for viewers because this is now (laughs) getting towards the end of the first novel, but Billings' character makes decisions based on justice rather than um, personal gain. And we see everyone else like more torn in that department or, or leaning towards doing things that'll benefit them rather than just thinking about self-sacrifice. And I, and I think by the end of the season, it's it, that even that is a little bit murky, right? Um, when you think about Bernard, I think the show did a good job of kind of adding some dimensions to his character too. Yeah. Is he, is he a bad guy? Like I, I'm still not settled on that. Like, uh, I mean, you know, he's a murderer or he, you know, he has, he has some connection to that, but you do get the sense that he's doing this because he thinks it's the right thing, but not even just the the right thing, but that it's necessary for their survival. It's yeah. I think there's like two different, there's two different mindsets. If you kill a person, right. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot more, but here's two of them. Um, One of them is here's a terrible person and I'm going to get satisfaction from ending their life. I don't think Bernard has ever felt that. Um, no. the, the other is, uh, if I kill this person, I'm going to save 10,000 lives. And that's what, you know, there's a war going on right now in Ukraine. And people who are, you know, in these trenches, um, I, and this is my bias because I'm pulling for Ukraine in this situation, but um, I don't think there's a lot of people who are like excited to get up and kill someone that day. But they're thinking like, I, I, if I do this, it'll protect my family. It'll protect my home. It'll give us a place that we're, we're able to live a safe, free life. And my feeling is that when Bernard does something bad, he really believes that I am saving lives today. And understanding that mindset, I think, really helps us empathize with people who are doing things that we think are unforgivable. Yeah. It doesn't make them right. It's just in their minds, what they're, what the way that they're justifying their actions is completely different than the pure evil that we like to put on them. Yeah, that was, that was my takeaway as well. Um, Like I said, in the book, he was just, I think he came off as a little bit, I thought one of my first read, I thought that he did seem to kind of enjoy that position of power that he had a little bit more, like he was a little more in your face about it. It seemed like, uh, uh, and so this, this was, this was nice. And I guess that by pulling the character of Sims up and, and adding this, um, <clears throat> and adding this layer of judicial in there, instead of him being like his, his direct security advisor or whatever the role was in the book, that, that kind of gives you a little bit more room to play. Like at first you think it's Sims and then you find out it's Bernard, but then really they're both, they're both kind of motivated by this idea of, the the survival of the of of the group rather than anything on the individual basis yeah for sure so yeah we're we, we've talked about quite a few different changes and you know so, some of the different ways that the you know adapting something like this is you know how that process goes I, you mentioned the writer's room so you're you're on whenever 
whenever they, you know, whenever they break a season, you're there, you're involved with that process throughout. Yeah. For the, the mini room where we set up the pilot in the first season, we just had a couple of weeks meeting every day in, in LA. This is before the, um, the pandemic kind of, uh, just, I don't know, four or five months before. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, uh, kind of outlined the whole show and even thought about what would happen in the subsequent season. So we knew how many seasons it would take. Cause, um, when we pitched this to the heads at AMC and Apple who teamed up to, to put the show together, um, you know, we had to kind of, we had to have budget in mind, you know, like yeah. what's our, what's our cast? How many, how many, um, settings and what's, you know, what's, uh, what, what do we need out of, um, sets and stuff like that. Um, and so we had to kind of block all that out roughly. Um, every episode we had, um, outlined and then the pilot, we had a real detailed outline. Um, yeah, since then, um, the writers kind of know where we're heading. And, and when we break a new season, I'll come in and help brainstorm and, and answer questions and give guidance. But, um, my, uh, main contribution is to read all the scripts and just give detailed notes. It's more which of a, is produ fun more when, of a producer role than a writer role. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. And when I, when I watch the episodes now, it's a lot of fun to see like the areas where, you know, I, I noticed the weakness and gave a note and see like the change and how, how much stronger it is. And, uh, <laughs> I, cool, you know, man. yeah, I feel like I helped really make the show, uh, better and not worse, which is my fear going into this. And I would just screw something up. Yeah. Um, it is a different thing. It's a different beast, uh, screenwriting as opposed to, to writing a novel and, or in, in this case, a, a series of stories that became a novel. And I've obviously written, you've written, you've written quite a few things over the years, um, pretty much every different way. Do you have a, do you have an interest in screenwriting? Is that something that you want to pursue more in the future or are you happy to just keep pumping out books? No, I, I love screenwriting. We, um, my writing partner and I created a new show for AMC, um, last year that we can't go forward with, uh, into a writer's room now because of the writer's strike. But, mm. um, we wrote an amazing pilot and we've written a few pilots together. Um, and, uh, a feature like we, we love working together and I love the medium. So, so definitely something I want to keep doing, but, um, I'm going to keep writing stories because uh those will actually see the light of day when i'm when i'm working on a screenplay i always assume okay this might uh you know get me uh, a paycheck or uh, some hired work to flesh it out more mm -hmm. but you never you never know if it's going to actually get made and, and enjoyed by an audience and i'm spoiled with books i know when i write something that someone's going to read it so i i still enjoy that more what would you say your favorite change from the, the original story to the TV show is? Oh, wow. Um, we've talked a lot of, uh, about a few of them, just the fact that we got to flesh out more characters. But the, the biggest thing for me is that we got to show Holston and, and Juliet working together on a case. Cause in the book, you know, what, because of the way I released mm -hmm. these, Holston was dead before I introduced Juliet. And so I can mention that they worked together on a case, but, um, I did you know, he wasn't there for me to, to have them in the room together. And the way we got to tell the story on the TV show, we get a whole episode of the two of them interacting. And that was definitely the most enjoyable change. Yeah. For me. I, yeah. I would put that up there. I, I also like the, um, the Bernard stuff. I thought that, that some of the stuff that was going on with him, the way that he sort of, he was cunning, right? He, 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 he tricked Juliet in a way, you know, like he, he left his options open, right? Like he was maybe if it would, maybe if it made sense to stay behind her and keep her in the position, then he would be all right with that. And, you know, then he got that really kind of satisfying thing. I mean, I, it was, it was devastating, but it was also kind of satisfying to see it ha play out in the, in the cornfield at the end of uh, whenever he finally revealed that, you know, he was, he was out to get the hard drive. 
you're pretty happy with the way that the pacing went up. I think, like I said, that this is probably the natural place to end this first season. If you, if there was a different way that you would have kind of broken it up, how would that have gone down? Like, would you, could you have, do you think you could have sped the story up at all or? You know, if, if you tried to tell the whole novel in one season, I think it would feel so rushed. Um, it would be it really might, difficult for casting too. Yeah. And, and for set dressing as well. Um, for reasons, you know, you and I know as readers, but we, mm-hmm. uh, can't talk about, um, covering the TV show, but, um, yeah, it'd be, it would have been really difficult. And I think, um, what's, I think uh, if, if people are watching this and they feel like I want more happening every episode, um, when you, when you binge this, like after, uh, today, people aren't waiting a week anymore between episodes like that. That whole you and I got to enjoy those two months, and that'll never be that that way again. Mm-hmm. And there'll be new viewers now for years, and they're going to watch the whole thing in a couple of sittings, probably. So it's going to feel like a a long film, you know. Um, I don't think they're going to, you know, at the end of a forty five minute episode, say not enough happened this week. They're going to hit next episode. And they're basically going to watch half of a novel, you know, over a eight hour period. And I, I don't think anyone's going to say like, not enough happened here, but I totally get it when you're watching this week to week. I felt the same way when I was watching Lost or whatever. I'd be like, Oh my God, you're stringing this along. Like when, mm-hmm. when are you going to get to something? When are you going to get to the smoke monster? When are you going to mm-hmm. answer all my questions? But that's not really what, uh, what people want. They, I, I think the frustration is part of the process. And yeah, if, if, if people are happy the whole time, you're doing something wrong. Yeah, I would say, you know, the first time I watched it, because I had so much anticipation of seeing the things I knew was going to happen, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I know where it's going, or I think I do from reading the book. So there were at times when I thought like, well, why don't we know this yet or something like that? But since I cover TV and I'm always talking about it and I'm always thinking about it, you know, I've, I've had this experience before. So I know that, that that's kind of what it is, right? It's, it's me. It's my expectation of what's going to happen next. But when I can step back and, and look at it again, then I realize what, no, this is actually really, this is really, you know, layered character stuff that's going on and, and it's going to pay off in the, in the future. And so, you know, I, I don't think the average person thinks about that so much, you know, and, a lot of times when I hear people say stuff like that, like nothing happened or something, and I'm like, well, what are the shows that you're watching that where there is something happening every time? Also, I, I don't want to make a story. I don't want to make a show that that appeals to those viewers. Nothing, right, right. Nothing against them, but it's a minority of unhappy viewers. Most people watching the show, um, when Juliet realizes that her dad, uh, I'll get I'll get teary just talk about yeah. this when she realizes that her dad didn't turn her mom in and he wasn't what destroyed their lives. And she forgives him and says, you know, he's like, I miss her every day. And she's like, me too. And I love you. And and they're holding each other. You can't get that moment without everything that uh, came before it. the, the flashbacks with, mm-hmm. um, you know, even with knowing what Allison went through with having her, birth control taken out and knowing that this doctor is complicit in that system, but he wasn't, you know, part of the problem that, that got, um, his wife in trouble. Like uh, you, you have to invest in a whole bunch of different little threads to get that moment. And when I go back and, and think about the season, it's moments like that. Um, or Paul telling, you know, telling his wife, like, you know, I punched this kid and, and you're like, oh my God, this is the guy who's so nice and obeys all the rules. And he mm-hmm. had, like, how do you pull that off in a single episode? You just can't. So, um, if you, if you make a show that caters to the angry viewer, you'll make a terrible show. Right. They don't exist. And the shows that they're talking about really don't exist. You know, I just ignore them. Mm-hmm. Like, I think the creators of Lost, uh, have admitted to this that they were watching. This is the first show Lost where, social media and blogs and online writing um, became so uh, loud that the creators were listening to uh, the show. Heroes is another one where this happened. Hmm. And the people writing it are like, okay, here are these 10 people who are really, you know, 
uh, got really strong opinions about this. How do we make a show for those 10 people? And you can start to lose what made the show have that kind of outpouring of, of interest in the first place. Yeah. So I, I think what, what we've done with this show is make the kind of show that we want to watch knowing that there's a lot of other people out there like us. Yeah. That, and that's a great, that's a great way to look at it. Right. I mean, that's, that's the dream, write your story and, and make your show the thing that you would want to see if you, you know, if you could, we're getting close to the end of our time. Is there anything that you would like to hint at or give fans in relation to the, the upcoming second season? Man, I wish I could. I, <laughs> I will say, um, watching what we're, what we filmed so far and being on set for season two, <clears throat> some of the shots, some of the things that were capturing on film, it's some of the most beautiful TV I've ever seen. And I'm so critical of, of any project that I'm actually involved in. Like, um, uh, I'm always have a, have a really, um, negative eye towards anything. So I'm looking for any problem that needs mm -hmm. to be solved. And I, I'm getting goosebumps just watching what we're putting together for season two. So, um, it's going to be a really difficult long wait, but it's, um, I, I hope people enjoy this first season because the next one's going to blow your mind. We got there in a different way, but I feel like we're, we're at the same place we were in the book, right? I mean, this isn't a huge departure from, from, the story it's more about the adaptation to the different medium and and sort of hitting those same same points so i'm curious because there are some there are some different things about the way that the second book is structured and things like that have you guys discussed how you'll move past that if if you get you know renewed um for a third season or where are you at in that kind of a you know as far as planning yeah, we, we know how we want to tell the whole show. Um, I'm uh, the I'm never confident we're going to get like anything uh, out of Hollywood, yeah. but the reception to this first season and seeing how invested um, Apple is with uh, the second season and and the writing that we'd gotten done on the third before the um, before the writer strike, I have a feeling we're going to get to tell this whole story. And we know how we want to tell the second and third books and, and how long that'll take. And it's, um, it, it's very manageable. Mm -hmm. So, um, dancing, dancing around what I can say, I think we're yeah. going to get to tell the whole story and tell it in a way that is very satisfying. I will say, um, any, any reader who's hoping that we're faithful to the books, if that's the measure of how much they enjoy the show, um, we're going to deviate um, going forward because there's just a better way to, to tell some of this story. And, um, we're going to break from the book in in some major ways. And we're going to do some fan service by sticking to the book and, in other ways that are, that are really dear to my heart and other people on the show who are huge fans of the source material. But if I know I, I'm a huge fan of, of, uh, fan fiction, the oral tradition of telling stories in different ways. Mm. I think if you think the book is better, then think of these as two different stories being told hundreds of years from now about similar events. Mm -hmm. And the two stories diverge on the details. But these um, are, you know, different people's accounts of what happened um, in a momentous uh, time. Like, go read the four Gospels in the Bible and they tell very different versions of, mm -hmm. of the same stories, like huge detail, really important things. Like the last thing Jesus said on the cross are different across three of the books. So embrace that. Stop being so pedantic and worrying about like, this is a little different from the book. Like um, it's, uh, we're, we're not trying to do a frame by frame retelling of an old story. Yeah. And uh, I think people are going to have to embrace that as we go forward. Cause we're going to, do some big deviations in the future that I hope blow readers' minds and they're like, oh my God, you really messed with my brain there. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the, the what I love about books, I mean, I, I books are my my favorite thing, basically. You know, I've been reading like a maniac since I was a little kid. 
and I, you know, everything I like about that is it is that it exists in my in my head. You know, when I'm watching TV, I want I want to be taken somewhere else in a different way. And I and I, you know, and what what really makes a an adaptation works is if I can, if I, if I experience the same feelings, the same, you know, if it, if I get to the same place in a different way. And then, then I have a new experience with that same thing, if that makes sense, you know. Perfectly said. That's exactly what I want you know, so, out of this as well. So I, I, I'm a huge reader as well. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I know we're cl- close to the end of our time, but Watchmen was one of those great examples of a film that was kind of a one to one adaptation that was good, but it was, we, we'd already seen the story. Mm-hmm. And then they did a TV show that was genius and had all of the same emotions of the source material without trying to retell it. And I'm more of a fan of the latter than the former. Yeah. So speaking of reading, what, have you been reading anything? Like what are you, do you read sci-fi primarily or where do you land? On uh, that? I mostly read, I mostly read nonfiction, but um, I am right now I'm like reading stuff to help prepare for other things that I'm uh, working on. So uh, reading a lot of scripts and, reading um, some kind of true stories from the Wild West to prepare for a, a novel and a screenplay that I want to work on. Um, best sci-fi I've read lately, um, uh, some older uh, books have been out in the last few years, like This Is How You Lose the Time War, which I loved. Mm. Uh, the Anomaly, this uh, French um, uh, sci-fi book. Um there's so much good stuff out there. I'm, yeah, I'm reading constantly all the time, but mm-hmm. I just read a couple of Fletch books just for nostalgia. <laughs> oh, Gregory McDonald books. So I'm all over the place. That's great. Well, I want to thank you for the, the time that you gave me. Um, hopefully we can do this again. Hopefully this is going to be a long-term project. The, the silo series. Um, I, I, I can't stop thinking about it. So I, of course, you know, I'll, I'll take any chance I can to, to talk about it. And yeah, uh, let's do it again. Let's, let's at least do it every season. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll definitely talk about that. Is there anything else you want to want to throw out there before I let you go or. Uh, no, man, just hope everybody enjoyed the show and, uh, share, you know, share the news with your friends. Like the, the more, um, viewers we get, the, the more seasons we get to make. So keep spreading the word. All right. Well, thanks again. Thanks, Pete.